Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be exploring the Call of Cthulhu adventure Shadows of Leningrad, written by Mike Ferguson and published in 2010 by Goodman Games as the third in their Age of Cthulhu line. Sadly, Goodman Games didn't renew their license with Chaosium, so that line is no longer in print, but you can still find old copies of it through various outlets online. The book comes in at 50 pages, but once you remove all the handouts and the five pre-generated characters, the adventure itself is 35 pages and playable in about eight hours. Maybe. I mean, it took us about 17 hours, but we also take a really long time. It offers investigation, a whole lot of combat, and unlike other Call of Cthulhu adventures, which are normally set in various parts of the United States or in England, this adventure takes place in Soviet Russia, home of furry hats, vodka, and the five-year plan. Which, because this adventure takes place in 1927, that don't begin until 1928 and lasts until 1940, which is five years. You know, as they say, in Occam you make plans. In Soviet Russia, the plans make you. Like with all of the Age of Cthulhu line, there is a lot of combat in this venture. So much combat that I recommend that you play this using Pulp Cthulhu rather than regular Call of Cthulhu. There is already a pretty Pulp vibe to this story, so it really works well for Pulp. In addition to combat and some lesser used Mythos monsters, the setting provides a really cool backdrop for the characters being strangers in this foreign land and you know, all the historical threats such as the OGPU. The module is also a bit railroady, making some assumptions about what the player characters are going to do or what order they're going to do them in, which that can be problematic if the players decide to take a different path than what the module's anticipating. Which of course is what my players did right out the gate. So what I'm going to do is offer my tips, my suggestions, and my criticisms as a keeper who has successfully run this adventure. And I'm Jack the NPC. I'm here to give it to you from a player's side of things as I get to fight the mythos evil cultists and the secret police in Soviet Russia. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. But send your game masters this way to see about running Shadows of Leningrad for you. But if you keep watching and you spoil yourself, you'll be sent to the gulags. Okay, keepers, let's do this. But first, the backstory. Long ago, before Russia was Russia, a dark cult of Ithaca formed, run by the Orkhanov family. And using a mythos tome, the Book of Dark Winter performed sacrifices and dark secret rites. Mixing the blood of sacrifices with bright paints, they painted elaborate and gruesome murals in the catacombs beneath their temple. Eventually, though, the cult was discovered by Peter the Great, and their temple was razed and the cultists destroyed. Or so they believed. Fast forwarding to the 20th century, Alexei Ornikov, a descendant of those original priests, has amassed power within the Communist Party, and he's been able to acquire the ruins of the old temple in order to build his estate upon them. He married a talented American painter, Charlotte Joffrey, who discovered several paint pots in the ruins beneath the house, and she used those to create some otherworldly paintings, and she also discovered the Book of Dark Winter. Meanwhile, another descendant of the Ornikov family line, Boris Churin, is now the director of arts at the Marinsky Theater. Upon learning of this book's discovery, he used magic and charm to turn the couple's daughters against them and uh, kill them and then hide the book in a spot where he could recover it. Charlotte Joffrey was killed, and her husband and youngest daughter Katerina have been institutionalized. Now, one criticism that I have is that this backstory that I just told you is spread out between two different sections of the book, making it pretty difficult to reference in-game, you know, trying to figure out what part was uh, disclosed at which portion. The investigation opens up as the player characters receive news of Charlotte Joffrey's death, as well as a telegram from the State Museum in Russia inviting them to attend her funeral in 11 days, which 11 days is a pretty rushed trip trying to get to, uh, to Russia from Arkham, but anyways, that's a different matter. But this is then going to be followed by an auction of her art collection. Now, the player characters can be sent on this mission for several reasons. They might be art collectors, that are, or maybe they're sent by a museum to recover some of Charlotte's paintings. Uh, characters that are experienced in the Cthulhu mythos might recognize the connection between the or Ornikov family name and the fabled Book of Dark Winter, and they might hope to acquire this mythos tome. 
They might also just be close friends or family, or be sent by the family to recover the youngest daughter, Katerina, who's nine years old, or maybe they decide to go and uncover the mysterious circumstances behind Charlotte's death. Like She was just an old friend of theirs, and they want to know what happened. For my game, I did a combination of these, where Miskatonic University sent some of the characters off to collect one of the paintings for their museum, and then another character was specifically sent by Charlotte's aunt to recover Katerina, who's nine years old, and bring her back to the States, and another player character wanted to acquire the Book of Dark Winter. Holy crap, guys. I just found out that Charlotte, that artist girl that we used to go to college with before she ran off and married that Russian guy, she was found dead. Not only that, Miskatonic University wants us to go over to Russia in order to pick up some of her paintings, so some sort of museum they're doing about famous alumnus. And get this, Charlotte's aunt wants us to go over to Russia and get her youngest daughter, Katerina, who's locked in an asylum right now, and bring her back to the States. And get this, the Orkinov family, who Charlotte had married, they were rumored to have some sort of mythos tome called the Book of Dark Winter, which I have always wanted a copy of in order to complete my set. We have got to get over there. We got to get that painting, get that girl, and get that book. Hold on, Katerina! We're coming to save you! Now, if you're using the pre-generated characters, each of them has a built-in motivation for going on this adventure, and you can begin the adventure as they're stepping off the train into Leningrad. Now, one benefit of the pre-generated characters is that all of them can speak Russian. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. You know, I only speak English, bad English, and a few of your mama jokes in German, but uh, I don't speak no Russian. The module recommends that the player characters bring in their own characters for this adventure. Each of them should be given a 50% in Russian. However, if these characters are all well-established characters that you've been playing with already, and you don't want to have them suddenly just know this language that they didn't know a week before, maybe you could have it where they just cram a bunch of Russian on the ship over there, you know, earning themselves you know, 10 plus a D10 points in Russian, or maybe they could just bring an interpreter along with them, or you know, let the players figure out how it is they want to deal with this language. Barrier. Now, one thing that the module completely ignores when traveling to Soviet Russia is that firearms are strictly controlled there. Now, personally, I'd prefer that we just go ahead and acknowledge this and make that a hurdle that the player characters have to overcome. You know, the investigators, you know, they might, you know, bring their favorite pistols along and have a little bit of trouble trying to get those across the border. So maybe they should consider how they're going to do it. You know, they might sneak them through in their luggage, or they might bribe some border guards, or maybe they try to score some on the black market. Market once they've gotten inside. Now, one book that I reread before running this adventure was Dennis Wheatley's 1933 novel Forbidden Territory, where the heroes are going into Soviet Russia to rescue a friend. And before they left for Russia, one of those characters who was extremely wealthy contacted a friend of his in an embassy. I, I want to say it was a Spanish embassy, and he had this friend send this box of cigars that had some pistols hidden inside of them ahead to the Spanish embassy in Russia in order to be picked up there. And there's along in the diplomatic bag. So once the player uh, or once the characters arrived in Russia, they visited the embassy where they recovered their pistols and also their cigars. And I thought it was just a really neat trick and this was something that somebody came up with in the 1930s about 1930s Russia and it's something that I think a character that has a really high credit rating might be able to employ that trick as well. Anyway, back to the adventure. Arriving in Leningrad, the player characters might have their first encounter with the Russian Secret Police, or OGPU, the organization that would eventually become the KGB in a few years. Now, the module includes them as a way of adding some intrigue. These secret police who might follow the player characters around, uh, turn them into scapegoats for any of these strange events that happen, or even make any problematic investigators disappear forever. It says that keepers can ignore this aspect if they like to, but I suggest that keepers instead lean into this aspect. The OGPU are one of the big reasons and one of the big things that makes this scenario interesting. We've got this exotic locale that's unlike anything else that the player characters, and especially the players, have probably ever been to before. And part of the fun of it is overcoming these new obstacles that they encounter there that they've just never had to deal with before. So it's very foreign to them, kind of like being in a foreign country. Now, at the funeral, the investigators can gather rumors, they meet all the main NPCs of the adventure, and they encounter another OGPU agent that's there, uh, this one posing as an artist that's uh, going to the funeral. Now, while they're there, the player characters are going to be given a key to Charlotte's house so they can go and view the paintings that are still there and not in the museum yet. And they're also going to be given this strange wolf-headed pendant by another NPC who's asking them to bring that to the house since they're already going there and give that to the manservant there for safekeeping. 
Yeah, sure, no problem. That is not a weird request at all. Guys, we just got here and met these people, and they have already given us a key to a mansion full of priceless art and a valuable heirloom necklace. Man, Russians are so trusting. Personally, I say that unless the player characters are personally known by these NPCs you know, prior to this adventure, or they're related by blood to Charlotte, maybe, maybe have it be where the NPCs instead give these items to an escort or a guide that is with the player characters. Some sort of NPC, you know, uh, somebody that was maybe hired by the museum to kind of show them around. And then you can have the player characters try to get these items from their escort, or maybe just trust the escort to do it for them. Or you can have something happen to the escort. Now the player characters, they can get their hands on the key and the pendant, or, you know, it just seems a little bit more plausible than these people just giving these strangers all this stuff, because that just seems, I don't know, a little bit weird to me. Now, from this moment forward in the adventure, the module is divided into six scenes, with the first five scenes, you know, providing all the clues that will lead the characters to the finale scene in scene six. Now, it claims it can be done as a free form and done in any order, but that is not exactly true, such as the player characters are assumed to go to the house, probably do that first because they were entrusted with this key and this pendant to give those to the butler, and then they're going to go on to the other locations that they go to, and then go back to the house again as a separate scene. Two of these five scenes are at the house, and then it quickly starts falling apart if the player characters don't do those things in that order, pretty much like mine did. Okay guys, we got this key and this necklace, and we're told point blank that we should go to that house and check out the paintings that are there. So what I think all of this is telling us to do, and what I think the Keeper secretly wants us to do, is go to the hospital and visit Katerina and her dad. Yeah, that is definitely where all those clues will lead us. Now instead of going through all of these as a detailed walkthrough, I'm just going to hit on the highlights and the problem areas for each scene. The first scene is at the house, and there they're met by the Orkhanov's manservant, Jonah, who is a lobotomized yeti. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you say that he's a freaking yeti? Yeah, he's a yeti. It's one of the reasons that I recommend that you use this game with Pulp Cthulhu, because it's kind of difficult to keep a really serious horror game going on when one of the NPCs is a talking yeti in a tuxedo, just kind of, I don't know, just kind of pulls you right out of the mood. Now, Jonah is a very nice, and he is incapable of lying, and he is also not that bright at all, meaning that he is never going to lie to the PCs, it's never going to occur to him that he could even deceive them, but he's also might not going to know or even remember the answer answers to need the 10,000 questions that the player characters are certainly going to ask him. Now, the house itself is pretty simple, and it's too simple, honestly. It's only a single story and has no secondary entrances like a back door or anything. Now, this is a criticism that I have for pretty much all the maps in the adventure, so uh, keepers, I suggest that maybe beefing this house up a bit, or at least adding a back door out of the kitchen. It's kind of weird that there's only one door to this house. Now, there are a few enchanted paintings around the place that change each time that the player characters look at them, and you've got different descriptions for you. Is this their first time to look at it or their second time? However, because all the paintings back at the museum have names, I suggest that keepers go ahead and name the paintings in the house. Now, the one that's in the parlor that has the apple and the tree, I named that Temptation. And the one that's in the tower with the, the cave, I named Fool's Aaron. And then the totally normal, non-magical painting that's in the master bedroom, I refer to that one as Guardian Angel. You might have Jonah tell the player characters that Elisa and Boris dropped by a few days earlier, or maybe dropped by just a few hours earlier, and they spent some time alone in the kitchen. That way, if the player characters on their first visit to the house, if they discover the secret door that leads down into the catacombs, it will make sense for the story that they're going to find all those clues that Boris left behind when he went down there to plunder everything. Because the module is assuming that the player characters are going to go to the house, not find the secret door, then leave the house, in which case Boris and Elisa, Boris and Elisa are going to visit the house and pick everything up that they want, and the player characters will return to the house, go ahead and just say that they have already been there, and have Jonah go ahead and say that, yeah, they were here, they locked themselves in the kitchen for a few hours, said they didn't want to be disturbed, so I didn't disturb them. Also, I would go ahead and add some weapons around this place, you know, hunting shotgun, maybe Alexei's service revolver or something like that, uh, you know, something left over from the revolution, maybe some swords somewhere, maybe just a wood axe out by a 
pile of wood or something, just sprinkle some weapons around this place. In the tower is a message that's been painted on the wall. Now instead of just describing that to them, I made my players a really simple handout, I also made a handout of the note that they found inside the paints case. Any keepers wanting copies of my handouts that I made for this adventure can find those at the link below. You can go ahead and download those there. Now scene two is at Revolution Hospital where Alexi and Katarina are being held, or at least a wing of the hospital. It's uh, serving as the sanitarium. Again, I find this place just a little bit too small. I suggest that you at least add a second floor to this place, meaning that you're going to want to add some stairs somewhere. I also added a locked door on the east side that led out to the street. That way there was a, uh, more than one entrance to this place, or more importantly, more than one escape from this place. There's also an OGPU agent that's hanging out in the lobby there, hoping that the player characters don't recognize them, and you know, hopefully they do recognize them and they know that they're being followed. Now once the player characters do manage to meet with the doctor, he will reluctantly allow them to go ahead and see Alexei and Katerina Ornikov. Now he is not a real doctor. He's supposed to be covering for the real doctor who's out sick, but really he's a cultist of Ithaca who poisoned the real doctor, then volunteered to come in and cover him. He's also got several goons that are posing as orderlies with the real orderlies that are tied up in a closet somewhere like that. Now the player characters will hopefully figure this out. Hopefully they'll talk to one of the other doctors and get tipped off by them, who's you know, hiding in one of the offices because he doesn't know who these weird people are. Alexei Ornikov has been driven mad and is now completely blind and raving something about two minutes to midnight. Now this is a hint for the player characters about the secret door at the house that's in the cuckoo clock. Now personally, I think this is pretty weak as far as hints go because, I don't know, I wouldn't have gotten this one. So I suggest that you add a little bit more to this. Like him shrieking, you know, cuckoo, cuckoo, after he says his little rant. Like, you know, two minutes to midnight, cuckoo, cuckoo, which is kind of weird, but memorable enough that maybe they'll remember the cuckoo clock, or if they go to the house for the first time after this, when they see the cuckoo clock, that'll make them think about it if he just keeps repeating that over and over again. Now, Katarina's in her cell drawing, and she appears sweet and innocent, if maybe a little pale. She'll tell the investigators that she has a secret that she wants to share with one of them, but insists that everyone else re leave the room first. Now, if they agree, the doctor is going to lead them out of the room and then try to lock them in one of the empty cells just kind of deal with them there. Now, for my game, instead of having the uh, orderlies kind of come up and just club the player characters aside the head, I am the dark doctor with a syringe of a tranquilizer as the orderlies came up behind and tried to muscle the rest of the player characters into one of the rooms. Now, meanwhile, in the cell with Katarina, if one of the investigators uh, stayed around in there, if they managed to look at one of the drawings that she's working on, they're going to get a pretty big hint that something is pretty wrong here. Now, Katarina is going to tell them she needs they need to lean in closer and she's going to whisper a secret in their ear. Yeah, sure, sweetie. What you drawing there? And, uh, huh. I got a bad feeling about this. And it's at that point that Katarina reveals that she's a vampire as she attacks the player character. Wait, did you say vampire? That is quite literally the last thing I was expecting. Yep, and she is tough as hell. And unless that player character is armed or the rest of the group can get inside the room with them, if they're trapped alone with her and they're not armed, they are probably pretty screwed. She nearly killed one of our player characters who was a very tough Pulp Cthulhu character, and I think they only lasted about two rounds with her and nearly died. Now, in our game, with the player characters and they're fighting this cultist doctor and his orderlies out in the hall and another character locked in a room fighting a vampire, it didn't take that long before one of the investigators, you know, pulled out a pistol and just started shooting. Now if they do, and that OGPU agent is still in the lobby, he's going to come and investigate these shots that he heard. Now for my game, I gave it three rounds for him to fight through the fleeing crowd in order to get up in the passageway where everything's going on. Then by the time he did arrive, Katarina had turned to smoke and she had fled the vicinity, and the doctor and all his orderlies were dead. So as the agent came up and rounded the corner and he saw these player characters and they saw him, instead of the PC saying, how you know, these guys attacked him and you know, maybe planting their gun on one of their bodies and searching around for the real orderlies that are tied up in a room somewhere and maybe cooperating their story with the rest of the staff that knew that something was up with this doctor. Instead of any of that, my player characters made eye contact with the agent and fled, meaning that that OGPU agent, seeing a bunch of bodies and now this girl was missing and the player characters fleeing the scene, declared that the PCs were all criminals, knew who they were because he'd been following them, and now the rest of the adventure they were being being hunted by the law.
which because this was the first location that we went to when we played it, now one of our player characters was seriously injured and another was really banged up from that fight and we were all now wanted fugitives from the law, yeah, the rest of the adventure was just a little intense for us. The third scene is at the museum where Charlotte's works are on display and also for sale. The investigators might come to this place during the day or maybe they might break into it at night after it's closed down and because that's what my players did when we did it, I added a back door to the first floor that led to a storage area down there and then opened up into the first floor lobby where they can then go up the stairs and see where all the paintings were. Now there are cultists who are wanting these paintings of Charlotte's, a specific one called the Red Shadow because hidden behind it is a map to the frozen temple where the cult can summon their dark and evil god. Unfortunately for these thieving cultists and the rest of the museum guests and the player characters, these enchanted paintings start coming to life and killing people. Well, you know as they say, in Soviet Russia, art collects you. Now one thing with these living paintings that uh, you can find at the museum and uh, some other places around the adventure, the module never ever mentions what might happen if the player characters to maybe throw some uh, paint thinner mineral oil on these monsters or maybe throw that on the paintings themselves or set fire to the canvases. I mean I, I assume it would be devastating but once these creatures start coming out of the paintings we're only given stats for the creatures and not really told what to do if we just attack the canvas itself or maybe use paint thinner on these things because, you know, technically they're made out of paint. Inside the pockets of these dead cultists, they're going to find some tickets to Swan Lake as well as a note from Boris. Again, I made this a handout that I could give to my players rather than just telling them about it, so any keepers that want to download my handouts, once again, link below. Now scene four is a return to the Ornakov estate. The idea being that the clues that the player characters get from uh, about the clock from the hospital as well as the museum is going to send them back to the house to look at that weird cuckoo clock that was there. Personally, I feel, once again, I feel that clue with Alexei who's screaming two minutes to midnight is pretty weak. That's the suggestion that I ad mentioned adding him uh, saying cuckoo cuckoo to it. Now it is assumed that the player characters will go to this estate, leave it, and come back, which my players didn't do that when they were there. They ended up staying overnight in order to heal because they were pretty bump, you know, banged up from their you know, encounter with a vampire, but when they woke up is when I had it fast forward to the next scene and certain things had changed, such as Jonah was now missing, having been sucked into one of the paintings, and also suggested uh, suggest putting some tire tracks outside from Boris and Elena's car, as well as Vladimir's car should still be parked outside because he never left, and it's never mentioned his car being outside but you know he had to have gotten to the house somehow so maybe mention when they get there the second time or like minded when they wake up the next day that you know his car is parked out there and that might give him a clue that someone has been there and hasn't left. I also stuck the picture of the clock from uh, Vladimir's office inside of his car because that was the clue that he saw that led him to the house and he was rolling it up to mail it off so the player characters if they see his car out there and they search it they'll find the tube that's got that picture with the clock in it maybe that'll tip them off as well as something's going on with his clock. You know, I understand that art costs money and takes up valuable space. I get that. But you know, I really wish that adventures where art was a central theme and valuable clues could be discovered in a painting that the player characters are looking at, that the adventure would at least give us a picture of this freaking painting. If the investigators check out this cuckoo clock that's in the kitchen and they move the hands to two minutes to midnight, you know, 11.58, a secret door opens up on the floor. Now a couple things with this whole gag. First, I say that uh, in order for the door to open, the hands have to be manually moved to those times. They can't just simply roll over to that time and once it hits 11.58 the door opens, otherwise it'd be opening twice a day and that'd be kind of weird to have a kitchen that did that. Um, or you could say that, you know, once it uh, is going along at 11.57 that the next minute it just somehow skips over to 11.59 and never stops on 11.58 itself. So when the player characters move it to the time, that's what opens up the door. Next, because people have been going in and out of this door several times like that, maybe have it where that clock resets to 11.58 every time. So the time on the clock should always be really off because it's always been, you know, moved backwards or forwards, right? So maybe that can also be a good hint to how long it has been since that door was open, if they just did the math on that, that you know somebody's been down there in the last five hours because the clock is now five hours past that. Now going down the stairs, they're going to find the catacombs to the ancient temple. There is a ton of stuff down here. A lot of it is very lethal, but a few things that I do want to point out. 
First, keepers should add some wolf designs to the book and the altar in the first room. And they do have one that's on the dead Mongol's armor and one that's on one of the handouts, but the wolf head is kind of important to this adventure, so I suggest you add a few more down here. They'll also find a couple handouts that's laying out what is going on around here and the story behind everything. They'll also find another copy of the map to the ceremony site if they haven't already found that one in the museum, so this is a secondary place that they can get that. They'll also find Vladimir, who's been attacked by some of the paint monsters and he was torn in half, and he can relay some valuable information to the player characters before messily dying. Now further inside, they're going to find Boris's business card just lying on the floor where he carelessly dropped it as he was plundering the catacombs. Which is weird as hell that he'd randomly drop his card like that, so a suggestion is instead of just having that business card lying around like he intentionally left it there, have it be inside of his torn coat. You know, like he came down here here, did what he needed to do, got the stuff that he needed to get. But then he was attacked by those paint zombies, right? And they got a hold of his coat and ripped it off of him, but he managed to get away. So the player characters, right, they look down, they see this torn and shredded coat, and they pick it up, and they check the pockets, and they find his business card. And that now makes sense why they'd find it here. Scene 5 is at the Marinsky Theater. The player characters might come at night or might come during the performance of Swan Lake. If they show up during the performance, they can encounter this huge firefight as cultists with shotguns just start blasting away at the guests, you know, trying to charge this eldritch staff that they have in order to uh, get enough power in it for the ceremony. And if they get to his office, they can encounter Boris, who's currently plundering the safe before trying to flee town, or at least going to the ceremony and fleeing town, so maybe they can get the key information of what is going on from Boris before all the bullets start flying, which is really the only value for this scene is being able to get that information from Boris. Ah, crap. You know, guys, I always forget to ask the bad guy about his evil plan before I shoot him dead. The final scene is the ceremony itself. It's located 50 miles outside the city, and while this module suggests a couple ways that the player characters might get a hold of a car or ride to get out there, it doesn't mention how they might just steal the car from those dead cultists at the museum, the ones that uh, the note told them to go ahead and you know, bring the thing in the car, so soon they would have a car there. Or if they could take Vladimir's car, because you know once again he had to have taken a car to get to the house, and after all, you know, the cultists and Vladimir, they're all dead, so they're not going to be needing their cars anymore. The ceremony itself is pretty straightforward. However, there are a lot of really powerful bad guys here. Uh, we have one child vampire, a couple yetis, and up to three not Ks, I guess that's how you pronounce it, I have no idea, which those things are horrible. Each of those would be a party killer and we could have up to three of them. However, one thing that the module doesn't mention are all the regular faceless cultists that should be here, you know? So keepers, I suggest that you put a few of them around here, or at least have a stack of dead bodies where they were betrayed and sacrificed to the Dark God, or maybe fed to the monsters, but some acknowledgement needs to be made that there were some other cultists here because the player characters have been encountering them before they got there, and you know, that just kind of makes sense. Oh yeah, you know, in fact, I would go ahead and stick a bunch of robes in the trunks of the cars of those cultists that went to the museum. Or maybe the player characters could get the robes off those cultists that were at the theater, blasted everybody with shotguns. So now the player characters can put those on and disguise themselves as cultists in order to get a little bit closer to that ceremony ring, right? Which, you know, that should be a pretty good idea to do. But in order to blend in with a bunch of cultists, you first got to have a bunch of cultists at the ceremony in order to blend in with them. The PCs have five rounds to stop this ritual, which this could be an insanely difficult fight. Once again, I feel that Pulp Cthulhu is needed for this adventure, especially with this big final fight here. Now, well, maybe the player characters will just go up and they'll shoot a lantern. Maybe they'll throw the wolf-headed medallion through the portal. Now, for my game, when the ceremony was ruined and they had thrown the medallion through there, I had Ithaqua reach through the portal and grab a lantern, pull her back through, as kind of punish her for her failure. So there was kind of a, a big dramatic scene of her death death because the ceremony failed. Once the ceremony is stopped, or if the ceremony succeeds and Ithaca is called forth to freeze the world, the adventure is done. At this point, any surviving bad guys, especially the vampire child, you know, they might escape and run away and pop back up later on as villains on some later day. Overall, I was pretty disappointed with this adventure. I mean, I knew it was going to be a bit of a mess when I started it, and I tried to fix all that I could beforehand, but once the adventure ended up making contact with the player characters, 
lot of other problems started revealing themselves to me that I hadn't noticed in advance. The whole part where they're expected to leave the house and then come back, that is tricky to do because if the player characters go there and they find the secret passage in their first time, then all of a sudden it seems weird that you would have Vlad down there without any hint or clue that he had shown up at the house, uh, such as you know having his car outside or uh, Jonah mentioning that you know maybe Vlad had dropped by or Boris had dropped by. There are a ton of monsters in this adventure, and many are extremely lethal wins at that. It feels a lot like the author was used to writing adventures for D&D or DCC, where there's stuff like healing spells and a lot of combat, because there's just so many powerful monsters in this thing that he expects you to fight. Now, if I were to run this adventure again, I would have the player characters discover a stash of military weapons, right? You know, like maybe leftovers from the revolution, like uh, rifles and a Maxim machine gun and a couple boxes of grenades that uh, maybe Alexei had stashed away from the war because he was an officer in the war. Or maybe you could introduce early on some kind of shady arms dealer to the player characters who's trying to sell them some sort of really cool hardware that the player characters are definitely going to want before all this is over. The adventure could really use a Dramatis Personae section or a cast of characters in just one central location because uh, the characters and all their stats are introduced in whatever scene they were introduced in, but when they show up later on, you're not having to flip back to find their stats and anything about them, so that's kind of annoying. It makes it really difficult to reference in-game. Then our experience was made even harder by us making ourselves fugitives from justice and having to flee the law because we allowed ourselves to get ideas deed by the OGPU, and instead of trying to talk it out and turn ourselves in and explain what happened, which we totally could have gotten away with, we decided to flee the scene of the crime, leaving a stack of bodies and a missing girl, which then got pegged on us as a kidnapping. But you know what? That could happen in any Call of Cthulhu adventure out there. I mean, I have served time at both Black Devil Mountain and Castro Negro, so this is not this adventure's fault that we decided to play the adventure on hard mode. My own group's interesting decisions aside, I don't recommend this scenario for Keepers, not without some serious prep work beforehand, and once again maybe just doing this one with Pulp Cthulhu as well. I really wanted to love this adventure, I wouldn't have run it for my group unless I thought it'd be a hit, but the number of issues that I found both before running it and while running it means that this scenario is far from game ready and Keepers are going to have to you know, be prepared to put in a lot of work before attempting running this adventure. I've Unfortunately, Goodman Games chose not to renew their license with Chaosium, and the whole Age of Cthulhu line has fallen out of print. Though, for some mysterious reason, you can still find PDF copies on the Piazzo website. You know, maybe not for much longer now that I've pointed that out, so if you want one, probably best to act quick. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. And if you want to support Seth's channel, consider picking up one of his books and novels, available in print or an audiobook, which he ain't pretty enough for an OnlyFans or nothing like that, so this is the best that he's got. Till next time, comrades, you have a great day. You know, it really breaks my heart when you think about all those wonderful licensed adventures out there that then fell out of print once the licenses expired. You know, stuff like those old games workshop adventures or the rest of the Age of the Cthulhu line. I don't know how hard it would be for them to maybe update those to 7th edition to put them out of the Miskatonic repository. I mean, I don't know anything about that, but it just really breaks my heart seeing them banished like that.